Oh, yeah, true. True. Okay, let's start it. Hello, everyone. Uh, one second here. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the first OAuth meeting. So before we get started, um, I would like to uh, mention that we have blue sheets. So I'll, I'll start this and please make sure to use this or just use that, the one on the screen. Thank you. Um, we need this to make sure we know who's attending and for you to be able to um, contribute or, or um, join, join the mic, and, right? So, so that's important. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hannes and Kalia will be helping us with uh, taking notes. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Um, and um, so uh, we have, uh, as you probably noticed already, we have three sessions uh, this time. Um, and uh, thanks for uh, to Roman for helping us get that third one. <laughs> uh, so we have lots of topics, and and uh, we used to have uh, some side meetings, and now we have three meetings. And uh, appreciate Roman's help with this. So and and Roman will have some some words here. Yeah. Good, good morning. Uh, yeah. If I could just have a little bit of an administrative note. I mean, I got the feedback loud and clear after this disappointment about how we play the side meetings. So one of the things uh, I try to do is I worked with the chairs and kind of an experiment with the ISG to do, you know, more tracks, kind of more days at the IPF, have special slots for uh, potentially working groups that want even more to, to really kind of overflow. We weren't able to kind of pull this off. Uh, and we have a kind of third session. So the, the signal that I'm really looking looking for is, is three enough or do you really want even more sessions than that? Because you know, if we have a more long ranging plan, looking at Prague, we may have, for example, some flexibility with that venue that we didn't have with this one because it was, it was actually kind of so near and how all that, all that hotel contracting goes. So a signal I would love to hear maybe by the third meeting is, do we feel like that was enough? And, or is it, would we have wanted four, would we wanted kind of five? Got it. And that'll help me decide whether I'll carry the mantle to really kind of push forward for something very, you know, very experimental for even more time uh, in 18. Awesome. Uh, Th thanks, Roman. Appreciate that. That's awesome. Okay. Oh, that area, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> the OAuth area? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, let's get going. So the note well, uh, uh, again, this, this applies here. So uh, the note well uh, governs everything that we do at ITF uh, from IPR to how we interact with each other. So if you're not familiar with this, please uh, pay attention to this and, and go review it. Um, meeting tips, um, you probably have already familiar with this. If you're um, uh, in person, so use that, the light tool uh, to log in um, and use that Meet Echo uh, application to, to join the mic. And please keep the audio and video off. And if you're uh, a remote, uh, make sure that uh, audio and video off unless you want to speak up. And uh, we hope that you could use also a headset um, uh, we st strongly recommend that. Okay. Um, okay, quick update on the latest. Um, RFC 9278, or RAR, Rich Authorization uh, Request, uh, was published um, a few few weeks ago, a few months ago. That, that's that's I mean, <laughs> Few, few months, I guess. So con congratulations to Torsten, Justin, uh, and Brian. So thank you for, for your work on this. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, we have three documents in the RFC editor queue, uh, DPOP, 
step up authentication and job response for token introspection. That last one is still waiting for the security BCP, which is uh, now with Hannes, and Hannes um, will uh, will start working on this soon. You gonna say anything about this, Hannes? Or are you good? Yeah, I'm um, reviewing the document. Uh, there were a few changes since I last reviewed uh, the version, but obviously a lot of work has gone into that, so it's a it's a very solid document. <laughs> trying to figure out that. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. A few announcements. Um, a pro you probably heard, or some of you at least heard about that um, uh, IAB identity program. So a few of us have been talking with IAB uh, about uh, identity at the IETF in general. Uh, and um, the IEB has decided to create a program around identity. Uh, and uh, Chris would, will be talking about this to, uh, today, actually, at 1, uh, 1 p.m. Um, at the IEB open meeting. So we encourage you all uh, to join that. And Colin and I will be talking about this also on the SAG meeting on Thursday at 3.30. This is a big deal, I think. Uh, if you want to shape the future of the identity of the ETF, you better show up there, right? So that's your chance, guys, right? So it's it's great to see this, and we hope that you guys all participate and, and contribute. Is that yes, it is. <clears throat> Yes, I I be open. That's yes, I be open, and it's part of that discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, OAuth security workshop uh, this year is going to be in London, and the registration open. So please register if you plan to attend. Uh, okay, our agenda for today: uh, Christina and Brian will be talking about SD Jot. Um, Aaron, which I don't see him yet here. Oh, here, he's, he's hiding there. So <clears throat> he will talk about browser-based app and auth 2.1. Uh, Mike will be talking about resource server metadata. Uh, Peter will be talking about cross-device flow. And uh, Hannes will wrap it up with uh, attestation in DCR. So that's for today. Um, we have tomorrow tomorrow's meeting. Uh, so Dick will be talking about JOT embedded tokens. Atul will be talking about transactions tokens. Uh, Peter will be talking about cross domain identity chaining, which builds on the above. Um, and Aaron will be talking about first party native apps. And on Friday, and notice that we don't have Thursday meeting, okay? So it's today, tomorrow, and Friday. Um, uh, Paolo will be talking about um, European digital identity wallet. Uh, Oliver will be talking about SD JOT based verifiable credentials. Uh, Tobias will be talking about JOT and CWT status list and authentication based client authentication, attestation based client authentication. And if time permits, um, uh, Tobias will be talking about also about client ID scheme. Any questions about the agenda, what we are doing today, tomorrow, Friday? Dick, you want to say something? <laughs> Dick is good. Leif. I just want to say that the overlap with GNAP on Friday is very, very bad. Yes. Um, yeah. Especially since I like, preclude, I'm just on my personal personal note. It precludes me from being there, and I'm actually the, one of the few people who's actually involved in the the UID wallet work. Yeah, I take responsibility for that conflict. The only way we could get a third slot is if I told the secretary we will accept all conflicts for the for the third slot request, and that was where we yeah. could put it. Yeah. Thanks, Roman. Okay. Uh, let's. Start here again. Okay. 
now I need to stop sharing. And Christina and Brian, you want to join us here? Do you want to drive it from there, or do you want to drive it from here? Drive it. I don't remember. Uh, the request. I, I just sent you this. See if you can work. Works. I think I screwed it up. It no, again. let me try it again. That was my fault. Maybe I'm not sharing. Hold on. What the heck is this? Is it with you? It works. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. Technical glitches, inoperability by the user here. Okay. So I'm here to uh, just talk about SD Jot Selective Disclosure for Jot um, on behalf of the working group and my uh, distinguished co-authors. So um, we'll jump right into it off of uh, a normal photograph of the city. That's uh, kind of my MO. So just a real rough agenda for what we'll be talking about today. I want to give a brief overview, a refresher. Um, I know it's always hard to sort of come into these meetings without any context and kind of pick things up. So I'm going to try to walk the line between providing a little bit of uh, Overview for those of you that might just be touristing the session uh, while not going too deep or too much time uh, for those of you that, that uh, know some of the content. Talk about the changes since last time uh, overall and then take a detailed look at a few of the more specific changes since last time and then uh, just take a little bit uh, look ahead. So uh, generally speaking, SDJOT is a mechanism for the selective disclosure of individual elements of, JS of JSON object used as the payload of a JWS structure. And really, that's a lot of words. Um, it's really about selectively disclosing JWT claims. Um, you know, a JOT is a, a signed token. You can't alter the content of it without breaking the signature. So um, SDJOT is a mechanism to allow for pieces of that token to basically be redacted or selectively disclosed without altering the signature. Um, some of this awkward wording kind of comes from the, the fact that we're playing with this world of what is a JOT versus what is a JWT or a JWS, and it's kind of a <laughs> JWE, so it's a little bit awkward. But really, it's a, it's a selective disclosure mechanism for JOT or JWS um, with, with JSON payloads. That was a lot of talking without saying much. But um, I do want to reiterate that, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm struggling up here. That simple is a feature. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ideas and approaches out there to doing privacy preserving schemes, selective disclosure and so forth. The goal of SDJOT is to build on existing techniques and functionality that the world and developers are already familiar with and provide a relatively simple mechanism to do SD, um, selective disclosure within the constructs of JWS in the Jose world that, that is already widely deployed and well understood and do it in a relatively simple way. So quick recap here, this is an SD JOT. You have your normal JOT construct of a JWS with the, uh, the header, payload, and the signature. And the actual selective disclosure mechanism comes on the end here with these the parts in green, which are tilde separated Base64 encoded chunks that we call the disclosures. Breaking those apart a little bit, decoding the JOT. Within the payload, you have an underscore SD claim that itself is an array of hash values. Each individual hash value maps to and ensures the integrity of an individual disclosure item. And the disclosure itself is a base64 encoded chunk of JSON that contains the claim name and claim value, uh, as well as a random salt that prevents sort of uh, reversing the hash from, from brute forcing and, and um, guessing the hash value. So you can't go from just the hash value to understanding what the claim is. And the um, obviously the name and value of the content are within the um, within the disclosure. 
and they're mapped to the sign content is over these hash values um, within, within the actual payload. So the, maybe this wasn't a good idea. The holder or the receiver of the SDJOT can then selective, select from those disclosures on presentation of the JOT and decide which of the information within it it wants to reveal. In this case, we've selected only the birth date, which is you know, referenced from within the, the payload itself. Take that there and throw that back on the end of the SDJOT. And this is the content presented um, that reveals only a subset of the claims that was in the original um, issued, issued SDJOT. I'm doing a terrible job presenting. I apologize. The idea being, though, that you can the, the holder can mix and match and choose which of the disclosures it actually wants to reveal without breaking the signature, thereby selectively disclosing the content. Do you want to? Uh, uh, now is a good time. Yeah. All right. I had a, a clarifying question. So if you go to two slides before two, the last one that you presented, two before the last yeah, one. Yeah. So. One. Um, the relationship between the between the the things that are in the underbar SD uh, array. Yes. Uh, the relationship between that and the you know and, and the two things on the right hand side that is the like what that is called versus what the string on the right hand side of the screen is called. That was the thing that was super unclear to me reading the document. Okay. Um, the the on your right hand side the green part the encoded content is called the disclosure inside the disclosure is the actual json content of the claim value claim name and assault the sd claim within the token itself is a list of digest values that point to the disclosures and the digest is calculated over the top of the base 64 encoded content of the, of the disclosure itself. So it's both a reference to by value because it's a, a hash of that value, but also ensures the integrity of that piece itself. Um, if that makes sense. And if there's you know, ways that could be further clarified in the document, we'd be happy to think about that. Um, okay, so uh, some changes since Yokohama. We published uh, draft four uh, right afterwards and draft uh, five uh, just last month, um, towards the end of last month or maybe in July. I don't know. I wasn't in Yokohama, so I didn't get to put a, put a picture of it here. Uh, but draft four uh, only had one change, improve the description of processing of the disclosures. This is a bit of a euphemism for the fact that the, there was actually a pretty major bug in there that... Um, if you read it really carefully and followed it, you couldn't actually do selective disclosure without rendering um, the whole thing invalid based on the, the normative wording there. So this was really kind of a bug fix that went out with 04. Uh, Try to get that fixed quickly. Um, subtle, but important. And then in 05, we have a larger number of changes. I'm going to go through them, <laughs> try to do it quickly. Basically, we uh, try to consolidate SDJOT terminology and format. So we had some. Um, I'll get into the details a lot a little bit more. The, the blue ones will be discussed a bit more in detail. And also consolidate the processing rules for the holder and the verifier. We had independent sections, uh, different rules um, for processing the functionality, whether you're the holder or the verifier. And they're really functionally pretty much the same thing. So we consolidated those. Uh, we define the structure of the key binding jot. Uh, we use the term key binding now rather than holder binding to be more specific that it's really about binding to a key, not a holder. It's a little subtle, but it really was only proof of possession for a key. So we tried to be more, more clear on that. Um, added support for selective disclosure within an array element, which is a new, new feature. We'll talk about the details in a bit. Added a, a JWS JSON serialization of SDJOTs. Um, added some recommend, uh, sorry, added initial IANA media type and structured suffix registration requests. We uh, added a recommendation for explicitly typing SD jots, um, added some security considerations about what it means to forward credentials and, and sort of maybe potentially continuously redact information. 
Uh, change up some examples to try to make it more clear and make decoy, decoy digest a little bit more obvious. Uh, improved the example um, around what was allowed in terms of variations of disclosures. It's not normative, just trying to clarify the wording. Um, added some text to the abstract and introduction to be more inclusive of just plain old JWS um, with JSON of some of the um, pain I was alluding to there in the abstract. It's really, JOT is JSON in a JWS. This is a selective disclosure mechanism for JSON in JWS. Um, and the line of whether that is or isn't a JOT is a little bit unclear, but we wanted to try to make it obvious, continue using the name JOT, but make it clear that you can do this with, with just JSON inside of a JWS. Um, tightened up some security considerations text around the scope of what the key binding JOT actually accomplishes, which is just to uh, do key binding, um, and proof of possession for key binding. Uh, it's not providing more or additional integrity of any of the message structure. Uh, tried to align some example structures, um, tried to clarify and continue, or uh, consistently use the term input claim set for the, the set of content that's used prior to redacting or selecting which pieces are selectively disclosed, sort of the raw input. Um, we replaced one general SDJOTVC example um, with one based on a, a PID from the European Digital Identity Wallet Architecture and Reference Framework to try to give it a little bit more real world uh, meaning when you're looking at it. Added and clarified some privacy considerations. Um, stopped recommending a claim name for enveloped SDJOTs. Uh, the name itself, like it, it was just sort of recommended. Applications that want to do enveloping will are, are free to and would likely use their own name anyway. So we just pulled that recommendation out. Um, we did mention the prospective future post-quantum algorithms um, for JWS would be supported. Uh, it's sort of implied, but we, we made it a little bit more explicit. Uh, we included the public key in the draft that's used to, you can use it actually to verify the examples now. Um, clarified that the SD alg uh, claim can only be at the top level of the SD jot payload or it doesn't have any meaning unless it's up there. So you only get one hash algorithm for the whole, whole structure. Um, and the default being uh, SHA-256 that, that's there if, if it's not specified. And um, not really meaningful to the draft, but meaningful for other work is the, the SD jot library that underlies this and is used to produce all the examples was split out completely from the repo. Um, and it now lives in its own world. Um, and we tried to improve the security, description of the security properties a little bit and be more concise about what, what the actual re desired security mechanisms were, or uh, not mechanisms, but properties that were achieved by this R. So. Consolidating the term terminology and format. Previously, we had some terminology that was a little bit awkward and hard to use sometimes. The combined format for presentation and the combined format for issuance are no longer used. Everything now, the whole structure is just called an SD jot. You can return to it in context, like a presented SD jot or an issued SD jot, but it's always just an SD jot um, without these long, cumbersome names. And it's always in this format, which is the issuer signed jot, the, the main jot there that has the um, selectively disclosed payload within it, the, the hash values, the SD underscore claim, followed by the tilde separated disclosures, followed by uh, another tilde and the optional key binding jot. And that final um, tilde is always included. This was the, the sort of the main change, at least from a wire protocol level or wire level on the format, is that the, the trailing tilde is now always part of the SD jot. Um, and then the, the terminology kind of consolidates and, and follows from that, or, or the other way around. I don't know how you want to think about it. We defined some structure around the key binding job. Previously, there was a lot of hand waving and saying you would want to kind of do it this way, but there was nothing normative around it. It seemed like it would make sense to be normative at this level because it could be reused in other contexts. Um, and so uh, it's relatively straightforward. It's signed. It has a, a type um, value, and it just requires a nonce, an audience, and an issue that time um, with some verbiage around that it has to be received within a time frame that's acceptable that issue at, issued at, and that the nonce and audience value come from application-specific context. 
but this is the, the general structure and requirements around the key binding job. We added support for selective disclosure of array elements, shown in an example here. These are a very similar construct to the normal um, selective disclosure stuff where there's a hash value within the main content that points to a disclosure, but somewhat different in that the disclosure only has a salt and the value. And within the um, actual payload itself, within the array, the sort of redacted or selectively disclosed claim is represented by a JSON object with three dots as the name and the hash value of the disclosure as the value of it, um, giving it some sort of pseudo namespacing and, and non likely to conflict ability to recognize specifically disclosure within an array element versus um, some other functionality. So this gives the ability to within a particular array element, selectively disclose individual elements of that, which wasn't possible prior to this um, update. We added a J JWS JSON serialization, uh, which is a lot of text on the screen here, but for general and flattened JSON serializations, there's now a disclosures array that you can place at the same level, top level next to the um, payload. And that contains the disclosures, those base 64 encoded JSON bits that are the, the disclosures uh, without any tilde separating or anything because we have JSON here. It's just an array of strings that contains the disclosures. And then also a KB jot, um, if applicable, member occurs at the same level. And you can see those here. Just providing on top of the JWS JSON serialization, a way to serialize these additional elements that, that, that are defined with an SDJOT. Added uh, just requests that are not actually registered, but media type and structured suffix registration requests, um, both for application SDJOT, media type in general, and uh, a plus SDJOT structured suffix syntax syntax suffix registration. Um, and this is useful for uh, being able to explicitly type SD jots in a similar manner to the way that it's recommended to type uh, jots in general in the JWT BCP. Um, and correspondingly added language in SD jot itself to follow the same sort of explicit typing recommendation. So SD jot itself isn't typed, but there's a structure it could be, but it's not particularly meaningful, but then there's a structured, structured suffix for that that allows for application specific um, uses of SDJOT to explicitly type themselves. Um, I'm a little unsure about the, the proliferation of media types for all this stuff, but it's sort of following the, the, the guidance that was provided in uh, JOT and more or less giving the equivalent and similar functionality here. So that's a briefish summary of the, the changes that have occurred coming up in here. Looking ahead a little bit, there's a few open issues uh, documented as of last week um, in, the, uh, in the issue tracker for this work. We need to actually make registration requests for the, the JWT claims that hasn't been done yet. Um, there's some three sort of minor-ish example issues that need to be fixed up and uh, a consideration to improve the, the structure of the whole overall document. So there's a few things that need to be done, but looking at it and kind of getting a sense for, you know, what's been presented here, the scope of the changes and the scope of the things that need to be done, um, it's starting to feel like maybe things are, are settling a little bit. You do this a few times and you, you get a sense that the, the minor or the, uh, the, the sort of significant changes uh, maybe are behind us. There's a lot of coalescence around sort of the main functionality. It, it's starting to feel like, um, the general specification is, is uh, yeah, settling in, is, is sort of uh, congealing. I don't know what the right word is. Coalescing, Coalescing thank you. <laughs> Doesn't mean things won't change. I'm not calling for, you know, working group call, last call or anything, but just providing a general sense that feels like things are coalescing and, and, and starting to stabilize nicely. Not that it's been unstable, but, but really uh, coming to that point. And with that, uh, thanks for your time. And maybe, uh, you know, pending travel budgets and various other things, global pandemics, we'll uh, see you in Prague. Yeah. Um, I've been having a number of trouble yet.
on the hand raise tool, but um, did you, um, in terms of the array disclosure, yeah, it occurred to me that the, the way the disclosures are listed right now, it reveals potentially private information that, for example, in your, in your example, that the person has more profession disclosures. Yep. And that there is another way that you could do the disclosures where you wouldn't reveal the text in the disclosure itself. So when you list all the disclosures, somebody would know that there are that there that there are, are any array types or not. Just curious if anybody had any thoughts about that. Well, um, so I'm not I'm not sure I entirely follow. There's a couple of things you can do. One is what I showed there was the disclosure of the individual or redaction. The wording's hard of the individual elements within an array, but that array itself can be selectively disclosable. So looking at just the payload of the JOT itself, you, wouldn't, you could rem remove or not reveal any information that nationalities was even listed. Um, within the nationalities itself, you could also add um, individual, uh, what we call decoy digests to sort of um, mask or cover up the, the true number of um, redacted content within the array itself. So there's some things you can do to, to sort of further um, obscure what's actually in there, but I'm not sure that's actually touching on what your your question was or what you were asking or suggesting. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mike. Mike Perrock here. Uh, yeah, I think follow on to that, like length of array uh, disclosure sometimes can actually, like how many items are in there can be an issue. I, I like the idea of possibly giving some guidance around, you know, how to properly randomize or select a number of decoys to include based on the size and things like that. Because that does seem at least like the least complicated path rather than trying to come up with something where you have a hash that represents everything in there and stuff like that. Because you could get way too over the top uh, from a you know, nested <laughs> structure standpoint and practicality standpoint, right? So one of the issues with selective disclosure is you can go too deep to where it becomes basically almost, you know, useless, right? So that's why uh, um, as long as there's some guidance. Can you get closer to the mic? Mike? Yeah. <laughs> is that better? Yeah, yeah. So yes. as long as there's some good guidance added in the privacy section, uh, I think that would be very helpful from an implementer side. Okay. Yeah, I'm honestly not quite sure how to give specific guidance on that because a lot of it is going to end up being, you know, very specific to the application of the deployment. But in general, the ability to have, add decoys like in nationalities, for example, you know, the issue of that type of credential might always include 10 nationalities, uh, regardless of the true number and, and otherwise, you know, otherwise obscure what, what would be there. Um, but I'm not sure that kind of advice. Uh, applies generally but certainly happy to to look at some um, suggested text along those lines or, or consider suggestions mm -hmm. about how to do it generally dick do you, do you want to say something yeah okay that's fine yeah. go ahead <laughs> just go ahead Tomar. state your name hi dick hart uh the nationality that syntax it looks like a hack it looks really horrible frankly thanks um, <laughs> um i think there's other ways to do that i'll write up and post some ways but since you're wrapping uh json like the the, the thing that's being you're creating a hash of you could have a bunch of those things just be separate items effectively like you can have each the nationality doesn't have to be an array you can have each of those be effectively a claim I'll write it up. So okay. It you, the, you could model the data differently, but there's been a lot of suggestion that that deployers, implementers want to model things as an array and have individual elements underneath that array be selectively disclosable. They they could be models as objects and use the other syntax, but um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, what's that? Um, Tobias, do you want to go to the mic? No, no, no go ahead. The, the, my, but another big piece of feedback is I was super confused through the whole presentation on exactly how it works and even looking through the docs. 
that I think you need to start off with. Here's the state, here's some data about people and how does that end up getting into being the object? Um, once again, I'll write up some suggestions, okay. but the whole buildup about how all this stuff works, um, th there's, you're in the middle of it and you understand it, but nobody that, anybody coming new into it, it's super hard to parse what's really happening. It's not, not an uncommon problem. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Th thanks, Dick. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Aaron. Which one do you want to start with? I think it's in the right order. Like uh, security in the same deck, right? Oh, is it one one deck? I, I see two here. Or oh, two to one. Oh, actually, yes, you're right. Oh, no. Great. Okay, let me yeah, hand you the the reins. Ready? Send it to you. Do I actually do something? Is it one of these buttons? Let me try it again. Let me try again. No, it's not working. Let, let me try it again. Hold on. Fix that control. Hold on. Let me try it again. There it goes. Okay. All right. Hello. Um, I'm going to start with OAuth for browser-based apps. Um, so quick recap of what the scope of this draft is. It's meant to be recommendations for people who are building OAuth applications that run in a browser, as in uh, the code is executing in a browser, which means either JavaScript or other scripting uh, languages that are in a browser environment, aka single page apps. Uh, that may or may not include a backend component as well. So from 13 to 14, uh, pretty minor changes uh, since we last talked, just a bunch of editorial cleanup stuff, um, updating some references to some of the new RFCs, which is always fun. And uh, there is a new paragraph talking about the possibility of a browser-generated non-exportable key still having the possible risk of being exfiltrated from the file system because it really only the browser APIs for that only guarantee non-exportability from browser APIs from the browser context, but ultimately the key is sitting somewhere on disk, possibly. Uh, there is no guarantee that it is a hardware-backed key. So just wanted to point that out in there. Um, that's the web crypto API, if you're curious. Uh, there are currently no open issues on the draft. So we've had a lot of good discussions and um, managed to work through everything, I think. So um, I don't have anything else to say about that. <laughs> that is a very short update on the draft. Um, yeah, so let's... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody any, has any comments? Any questions or comments? Um, you think you're ready for quick group last call then? I think so. I don't have any anything left I want to do okay. on the draft. And I think we've had a lot of good discussions in the last couple of meetings. So okay. yeah. Okay. So we'll do that. Okay. That's on the mailing list, right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Anybody has any problem with starting a work group last call on this? Yeah. Well, it's, it's work group last call. And expect people to review it, right? OK. Great. Thank you. Let's move on. Uh, great. That was uh, making up for some of the, the We'll try to make up some of the time. Uh, we might have to use it for OAuth 2.1. So 2.1, um, this draft, um, we've had a couple of changes since, well, a lot of changes, actually, since the last draft. Um, since we last talked, uh, this is IETF 117. That should have been 116. From the last IETF meeting, 
um, there is a new introduction section that kind of rephrases what, uh, how the whole draft is, is positioned. So please give that a read. Uh, again, a lot of references to things have been updated since there are new RFCs from the group. But the biggest change is that I've been working uh, closely with Daniel Fett to get OAuth 2.1 and the security BCP uh, back in sync. Because it turns out over the last like two years or so, stuff has happened to both drafts independently, even though 2.1 is supposed to be a consolidation of the security BCP, but discussions have been happening in both places and they've kind of started to get out of sync. So we went back through and compared notes and um, uh, made changes to both drafts to bring them back in sync. So this is a short list of the summary that of things that changed in 2.1, which were changes that we've already talked about in the security BCP. So that is hopefully not news to anybody. Um, but now those are correctly reflected in the 2.1 draft. Um, the other significant change is um, based on the last discussion, the, in the request of the token endpoint, the redirect URI parameter is no longer part of that request because it doesn't serve any purpose anymore uh, in, in the context of this draft. So we talked about that last time and now that is, uh, is in the draft. So there are still more things to do before this one is ready to wrap up. Um, there's still some trailing uh, normative language in some of the security considerations sections. So that's been an ongoing project to sort of identify those and move them into the appropriate part of the doc. Uh, part of that is because this is a merging of the security BCP, which is a combination of security considerations and normative changes as well. Um, and then there's the sort of admin um, admin task of describing the the differences from OAuth 2 and for which role things are actually going to be different and break. Um, and then 128 is a new one. Um, this is something that was pointed out that the OAuth 2 draft actually has a description of how the um, how it uses the form encoded syntax, which uh, apparently is like one of the only places that description exists. So it needs to get added back. I can't remember exactly why it got removed in 2.1. I think it was part of some other section that wasn't important anymore, but it, it turns out it is. So um, I would appreciate some help with that because that's dealing with like string manipulation at a level that I care very little about. So um, yeah, if anybody wants to jump in and write some write some text for that, that'd be great. Uh, there are still some more open issues to discuss, um, and then happy to continue that on GitHub. I'm going to be doing uh, working with the other editors to do a big push to close as many as we can um, soon, but still, still there's some more things left. Um, as far as how I expect the rough timeline for this to go, um, we have now finished uh, the security BCP sync, so that's done. This little green check mark there. Um, we do basically this before we can get to the point of asking for working group last call in 2.1. We need the security BCP to be published and we need the browser BCP to at least be through working group last call since it also contains things that are in 2.1. Um, and I would also love to get. Uh, an earlier review from maybe the HTTP working group on some of the stuff because some of the, I know that some of the stuff in OAuth 2.0 was not doing HTTP things exactly right. And I would love to make sure that we're not repeating those mistakes again. Uh, so I was hoping to, uh, we can get somebody from HTTP to give it a read through um, and then we'll be ready for last call. So still a little bit of work left on this one. <clears throat> yeah, I wonder whether the this ITF meeting may be a good time to talk to the, yeah. to find some people from the HTTP community to, to do a review, because that would be fairly soon. We just talked about doing a working group last call on a browser PCP. Mm -hmm. So so that would be timely and given the vacation period. So maybe they, they could do that in August. And so we could start then a, a working group last call, like way before the next ITF meeting. That would be 
great. Okay. That's that's the idea. That would be very great. Uh, I feel like that's an optimistic it, it, timeline, but yeah. that would be wonderful. Yes. And and do you have more information about that the, the HTTP issues that you, that you? Yeah. Um, I feel like anytime they have looked at other drafts, they have a list of things that they are very tuned to spot that other people are not. So I don't know if I would be able to make a list of things that I think are. It doesn't have to be a list, just a few examples. So um, people would know what, 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 what is it that we're talking about here? So one example is anytime um, there are example request and response bodies in the spec, making sure that the, uh, the syntax of the, the headers is now is correct and up to date. That's one example. Um, I remember one example from earlier was the um, content type application JSON. The examples all then also specify the character set, but that's actually redundant because the JSON content type specifies the character set already. Okay. So uh, we fixed that one a while ago. Um, it's just little things like that that someone who's better tuned to working okay. with those all the time uh, spots very quickly. Okay. Um, Mike, you want to say something? Okay, Mike. <clears throat> and after that, Hannes. Mike Jones. Um, I would suggest if you can get Mark Nottingham's eyes on it, he will catch all that stuff. I have recent experience with that with Depop, mm -hmm. where as we were doing the IANA registration, and Brian will attest to this. He suggested that we use syntax description that's now current in uh, HTTP RFCs, which he's an author of. So he's a busy guy, but he's a nice guy. He'll he'll help you if you can get his eyes on it. Yeah, great. Hannes. Yeah, um, he might be a good guy, but maybe also uh, we just reach out to those and talk to Roman on what the sort of they have a process for doing these type of reviews. Uh, so we'll just dump that in there and, and yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Dimitri. Hi everyone, Dimitri Telegin, back base and key clock. Uh, could you please get back to the slide uh, enumerating the uh, items from uh, BCP that we are going to, to incorporate, especially course? So, uh, do, which do slide? Think, uh, which, which slide, Dimitri? Uh, yeah. Again. So uh, there was an, a list of items from BCP that we are uh, planning to Good incorporate. Back. So Good most back. importantly, yeah. So we are planning to explicitly prohibit course at the authorization point. Uh, at the same time, there is a document called OAuth, just a sec. So the official name is OAuth, Multiple Response Type Encoding Practices. Uh, the document published at openid.net. And uh, Mike Jones was one of the co-authors, so probably he, he could give like, more background on the doc. Uh, the document says, uh, that it is expected that additional response modes may be defined by other specifications in the future, including possibly ones utilizing cores. So there seems to be some sort of conflict between the documents. So uh, any ideas how, how we could approach that? Thank you. I, I don't think there's a conflict. I don't think that anything having to do with the additional response type would, would require cores at the authorization endpoint. The reason for that was a security BCP was brought up in the context of the security BCP to prevent um, prevent bad things from happening because the browser should not ever be making a JavaScript call to the authorization endpoint. The browser is supposed to redirect to the authorization authorization endpoint, which is also true with other response modes and response types. Yeah, I'm giving a thumbs up from Mike. So thank you. So the all 2.1 will have precedence over what we have in the document that I mentioned. Okay. I okay. Thank you. Uh, Try, uh, Dimitri, do you want to repeat that? So just wanted to say that all 2.1 will uh, sort of help have precedence and priority over the document that I've mentioned at openid.net. 
uh, that OpenID document shouldn't be in conflict with this though at all. It also would prevent CORE's requests at the authorization endpoint because it's not needed for that draft either. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mike. Hi, Dimitri. This is Mike. If you'd like to write the list on what you perceive the conflict as being, I know Aaron and I would be glad to look at that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Great. Keep going. Um, that's it. That's all I have for this. Um, so we'll give you some time back. And OK. Any? Anybody has any comments, questions? Hold on. Somebody's hesitant there. <laughs> but go to mic. Uh, this is Brian. Um, my my memory's probably bad, but I thought I remembered a distinct discussion about removing the redirect URI in that in the token endpoint call where the conclusion was not to change it. Um, and then so I was I was like I was a little surprised to the conclusion that. was remove it, but leave a note that once we get to the end, if it ends up being the only thing that is breaking compatibility, then we put it back. So the expectation is that there are probably a couple other things that are um, technically not backwards compatible. And if the redirect URI parameter ends up being the only thing that makes a client break in, in cases, then yeah, we will put it back. But if it's not the only thing, because there's already other things that make an older client incompatible with a newer AS, then it's not, there's, then it still serves no purpose being there. Okay. I, I was kind of on the fence either way, but I was mostly just trying to fill in. Get closer mind. to the mic. I was on the fence. I could see good and bad in it either way, but I it just couldn't reconcile it with my memory of what happened. I think we discussed it like during the pandemic in an interim. Was was there a No, I think it was last meeting. So there was maybe a more recent. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. My own. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thanks, Aaron. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see. Mike. Good morning. Um, Mike Jones, I'm, uh, here to talk with you about the resource metadata draft, which I've worked on in the last months with Aaron. Um, okay, the floor is yours. Thanks to Aaron for helping me do these slides. You'll find that he makes more interesting slide decks than I do, so that's been great. Um, as, as they say when, you know, Hawking wears on TV, now with extra stuff. Um, and this is now with WWW Authenticate, which we were asked to do in uh, Yokohama. So here we go. Next slide. So since ITF 116, uh, we were asked to consolidate the two drafts that we had, the resource metadata draft and the authorization server discovery draft, which used www.authenticate. Um, Aaron took a stab at it. He didn't like it. I took a stab at it uh, slightly differently, but using a lot of the text from his draft and he liked it. I liked it. And so here we are. Next. So what is this for? Um, and this was the key message of Aaron's that I think resonated with people in Yokohama. That this is for use cases where you have a client, like an email contacts calendar client or whatnot, which occur in the wild, that don't know in advance what resource they're going to use or what authorization server they're going to use. They have to be able to dynamically 
connect with those, even though there's not a pre-established relationship between, you know, the rogue calendar app that Ori wrote and Google. I'm, I'm totally jerking you around. Hi, Ori. Um, so you'll have these apps that work with many resource servers, with many authorization servers, uh, but you don't have pre-established relationships. And so it's useful to have metadata to be able to establish those relationships on the fly as needed, at least at configuration time. Next. So the new step zero that you can do is you can go to the resource without an access token, maybe with an options request, and have it send you back information about what you need to do to connect to it. So in this case, our example, www authenticate response has the resource identifier and it has a scope. You could have other things. Uh, this is part of an extensible uh, HTTP framework, as most of you know. Next. So um, there's going to be three slides on step one, because this is about what does the new protected resource metadata requests and responses look like. Uh, this is not a very surprising looking request. It has a well-known URI and a host, and you do a get to it. Next. And you get a non very surprising response. Uh, you told what the resource is so that you can double check somebody's not spoofing you. Uh, you potentially are told what authorization servers this resource is prepared to be used with. Uh, maybe some things about OAuth protocol messages that are and aren't supported, uh, documentation pointers, et cetera. Uh, the particular metadata values are intentionally very parallel to those in, I think it's 8414, the authorization server metadata. Um, obviously with differences where it matters that it's a resource rather than an authorization server. Next. So going back to our calendaring example, um, let's say we found out that the resource identifier was calendar.example.com. We get the metadata from it. And uh, for instance, we might learn an authorization server that we want to use. And again, some things about the OAuth protocol elements options that are and are not supported. And, and see, Aaron does these yellow sticky things. I never would have thought of that. <laughs> Next. Um, now we're getting authorization server metadata. Uh, many of you do that many times a day. And sometimes you've written code to do this. Next. And then you use this thing called OAuth2 to uh, make an authorization request using the parameters that you discovered uh, through the discovery requests, the metadata requests. And down at the bottom are some pictures of what this might look like at real servers, what some of the UX elements are. Next. And so you get back an authorization response. Uh, in this case, you've got an authorization code, which you'll later redeem at the token endpoint and uh, go to town. Next. And then finally, you get the pretty access token and you supply it to the resource that you did metadata discovery for. And you get the calendar data response in our example. Next. Um, so as we were working on the details of the text, one of the questions, which is really a security question that uh, we talked about, and I thought, let's just put it in the slides and get people's brains on it, 
would you ever want the WWW Authenticate response to return a resource identifier that was not at least at the same host as the place you made the request? Now, Aaron pointed out that there may be times that it's hard to host uh, well-known OAuth uh, protected resource. Um, and, you know, that's true of any use of well-known. Uh, this draft sort of assumes that you can, and there's a lot of cases where you can. Uh, but this is a security question, which we're clearly going to have to normatively address in the document and probably in the security considerations. John Bradley, would you like to speak? John, are you in the line there? He is in the line. So, yes. So did, you can, can you use that, please? No. Oh, this one. Thank you. Uh, John Bradley, Ubico. Um, so I don't offhand see any problem with having the resource at a different host because lots of lots of people have problems deploying dot well known um, on central infrastructure. I've heard that any number of times. Um, so I don't think that's the the main security problem. Um, I guess my question is, we when we looked at this many years ago, the reason why we didn't do resource metadata was that it was a great phishing opportunity, that a resource could create a phishing page that was Google and, you know, random, um, I need access to render random calendar app could force a legitimate client to take you to something that looked like Google and ask you for credentials. Now, if you happen, if everyone's using pass keys, that's not a problem, but until everyone adopts that, are there any mitigations to stop this becoming yet another phishing vector? Because I don't see any offhand. Um, Aaron is standing. My short answer is that it's often the case with these apps that you can dynamically establish connections. They do have a wait list. They, they understand uh, you know, that certain Okta servers are fine and certain Google and Yahoo servers are fine. Um, and they might you know, warn you if you're typing in a server address into those forms. Um, that it doesn't recognize, and that is a practical mitigation. Aaron, or, or John, you're still on the queue. Can you go back to slide two, please? I was about to say the same thing. Which slide? Number two. Number two. All the way to number All seven. All the way to Step number two. Step zero, I think. OK. Next. Oh, next slide. This one. Yeah. So this is this screenshot is the current user experience in many, many applications. And this is also a phishing vector. As in someone can be instructed to type in your password and a server address that is the wrong server. And currently if the client will then go send your password to that server. So there is currently a problem of risk of a, of a phishing attack happening. Um, I don't think that it is worse if this, instead of asking for a password, opens up a browser to the discovered authorization server, even if that authorization server is a fake one that is impersonating a different authorization server. The reason I think it's not worse is because uh, there are more opportunities to see that something is wrong in that case. And we also have technology to solve that problem, which I think John is intimately familiar with, uh, WebAuthn and passkeys. So that lets us solve, solve the phishing problem and at the very least have it be more obvious that there's something happening because you can see that the address bar is not the same as not actually google.com or whatever, uh, whereas the current experience is 
worse because you just give your password to the wrong server in the first place. So that's, I think it's, a, I think it's an improvement. And as we get more and more deployments of phishing resistant authentication mechanisms, it's just going to get better. Okay, Neil. Neil Jenkins, uh, fast mail. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, so I, I agree with that. I think, you know, this is definitely an improvement still on the previous situation. Um, uh, ideally, you wouldn't be typing any server address in here at all. We've got various auto discovery mechanisms now. So as long as the user can type in their real email address and don't mess that up, you should get a real server auto discovered, which can then do this flow. And you obviously will get to the real authorization endpoint as well. Um, with the bearer response, um, I was just wondering, do we need the uh, intermediate well-known? There's a lot, can we, not, can we just return which authorization server we want directly in that? I just wasn't clear why there was the intermediate step for the um, well-known for the resource server first. Um, that's what Aaron's draft did eight months ago. Um, and what that doesn't do is give you other metadata about the resource. Uh, just like you can have a lot of different kinds of metadata, such as protocol elements supported and not supported. In 8414, the authorization server metadata, this gives the resource an option to, in the future, for instance, say, only give me DPOP tokens. I won't accept a bearer token. There's lots of other things you can do with a general metadata mechanism once we have it. And so I think it's quite valuable to uh, extensible OAuth ecosystems, particularly ones where per Aaron's use case that you don't know the resource server and you don't know the authorization server in advance, you need a data structure to learn about it so that you can establish working connections with it. Sure. Okay. One uh, one final comment just on the, you know, might you want a different domain um, to the server you're connecting to. We could definitely make it work with the same domain, but it would be easier if you could give a different one because we have things like carddaf.fastmail.com is proxied straight through to a card dev server and doesn't normally have to serve up separate files. And so you'd have to do some Happily on the nginx config to make that work. So it'd definitely be easier if we could. Give okay. A different domain there. Who would like us to help write the security considerations for what you do to mitigate problems that might arise from redirecting elsewhere? If I don't get any volunteers, I'll just go to Santiago and talk to John, but I don't want to have to do that. <laughs> Si, senor. Okay, Tobias. Yeah, so I was just on on John's consideration. One of the um, one of the ones that I think has probably been discussed, but is is worth like elaborating on is is in situations where the client can um, somewhat provide a little bit of UX friction, maybe at, at the very least, around like I've never interacted with this IDP before, and just letting the user know that. Um, of that fact, right, versus an IDP that is perhaps well established and the client has some awareness of and has redirected users to uh, on a consistent basis, that, that can be somewhat of a mechanism um, that can mitigate perhaps some of the more harmful phishing attacks. Um, and, and maybe that is just a good security consideration to elaborate on in the draft is that the, the client can be, can take that responsibility to mitigate some vectors of possible phishing. Thank you. I think next slide. Okay. As John alluded to, there's been a history. I mean, we did this at the same time originally as AS metadata. Uh, the thing that made this current again in my mind is uh, Roland Hedberg and others in the OpenID Connect Federation world decided they wanted these data structures and to use them. I know. Dick has told me privately he has use cases for it. Um, Aaron and Benjamin did the resource discovery thing or the, the AS discovery thing. It was enough like this that in Yokohama, we decided, you know, let's 
combined forces. And so we merged and here we are in San Francisco. Next. Um, I would like uh, additional reviews by working group members, obviously. That's always goodness. Uh, the stuff that was added is strictly additive. It didn't change anything normative about the past documents. Um, and I think following some reviews, I think it's appropriate to ask for working group adoption if the chairs concur. Okay. Any questions, thoughts? Can we get volunteers to review the document? Peter? Leif? <laughs> you wanna, wanna speak up? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna speak up and support. I mean, this, there's, um, as um, Mike mentioned, this has, um, some applicability, uh, and uh, even though it's not certainly not official in any way that or, or even sort of um, cons there is no consensus around the use of federation in, in OIDC federation in the EU uh, ID wallet, it will definitely get used in the large scale pilots on the way as a, as a mechanism for sort of organizing some of the uh, piloting activity. And I can, my personal belief is that it will actually have have a use in production, large scale production in the EU, EUDI wallet space. Um, so it is definitely appropriate to get this done and published. Thank you, Leif. Thanks, Dick. Dick Hart, uh, echoing Leif's comments that um, I see lots of use for it, very supportive of this. Also want to go back to the SD jot because I think I was kind of hard on Brian <laughs> that I think that's an amazing cool technology and I'd volunteer to read Mike's thing, but I'm going to spend my time on Brian's thing because I think that needs a little more help and is super cool tech. Thanks, Dick. Okay. Anybody else has any comments? So we got two volunteers to review it. Three. Oh, a Dick too, okay. right? Oh, no. no? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. He's following the directions on my T-shirt. <laughs> Thank you all. You would also review this one. <laughs> okay, Brian. I did actually do a, a quick review of it. So while we have the time here, I, I struggled a little bit with the, um, whether the resource metadata is, is intended to be for consumption by the client or by the authorization server or both in some cases. And I, that could use some uh, either some more clarity or some further separation in the draft. Um, and so there's my review, but, uh, and also I, I continue to be worried about the future. Um, if in fact this gets adopted and worked on what's going to happen with the way that the, uh, the well-known is handled in resources that contain path constructs, as I'm sure, you know, that's, yeah, I've, I've arm wrestled with Mark Nottingham and so far he's beating me. Yeah, and I don't know that this time will be any different. So, um, I, yeah, I guess you're aware of that. I, maybe thinking out loud a little bit more, is there is a reason in this construct, the challenge returns the resource? W would it make sense to just return the actual path, like full path to the metadata file rather than a resource identifier at that point? And, and avoid all the well-known construction. I don't, it, it's not a fully formed thought, but in following all the pieces that are in here, I'm not sure we actually need the, the, the well-known resource like construction in the way we have in, in other places. It's no problem. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Aaron, go ahead. Uh, I, like, I like that idea um, and I think one way to bridge the two is to suggest the path should be dot well known, but not make it a requirement. So if you are using the WFO authenticate discovery, then that actually points to the actual metadata document. Whatever that path is, it doesn't matter. It's not defined in the spec. Yeah. That points to the, and then we can suggest that maybe a good place for it is, you know, this dot well known resource metadata if you don't have a better idea. In Yokohama, I do remember standing at the mic and saying, 
we could have www authenticate return an identifier called something like resource metadata, which was a URL to the metadata document rather than the resource identifier. I, I don't think, this is just me, I would like to get the thing adopted in the working group and then incorporate some of the feedback that we get on the list. Yeah. It was just an idea to sidestep that. It, 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 you're not the first to have that idea and it's not a bad one. Okay, Ori. I agree with all the comments, especially about the, you know, not putting dot well known, you know, past certain other path elements. Um, the original reason I queued was, I'm interested in in why the the history behind WW authenticate being added, and if there are other are there other structures that serve a sort of similar purpose to WW authenticate that are relevant here. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how that came to to be added afterwards, as opposed to being there from the beginning. Just some of the history around that. Um, this was part of the two different drafts. So originally Mike's draft was only about the resource metadata document and didn't have any mention of how you would find it or how you would find it would be, you know that it's at the dot well-known path. Uh, and then separately, I had worked on a path that didn't talk about resource metadata at all. It was just the WW authenticate header pointing to the issuer. So this is the combination of the two. Thanks. Okay. I think we're good here. So we're gonna wait for the review and then they call for adoption after that. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Peter. Okay, uh, so uh, once again, thanks everybody for being here. Or get closer. No. <laughs> um, okay, thanks everyone for being here and uh, thanks for the opportunity. It is always uh, such a privilege uh, to, uh, to be at the IETF. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit, quick update on the cross device flow work that we've been doing over the last um, sort of nine months or so. Um, and this is an update since Yokohama. Uh, so as always, uh, well not always, but a beautiful picture of San Francisco as imagined by Dali, because uh, I don't have a camera to go out uh, and take some pictures this time around. Okay, so what are we gonna cover? Uh, quickly, I'm gonna talk a little bit why we're here, uh, just a recap of the problem for folks who are not familiar with it. Um, a quick update on where we are, and then kind of what, where do we go next with this work? So, um, why are we here? So, uh, so typically when we look at attacks, um, a lot of our focus is on uh, you know, focusing on analyzing the protocol, uh, looking at design and technical issues, implementation issues. One of the things that we've discovered is um, that there's also this sort of social engineering aspect, right? That's turned into a fairly big vector for people uh, finding ways um, to steal identities and get access to the system. And eventually this, uh, these attacks result in sideways uh, or, or lateral moves. Um, and tokens getting exfiltrated, etc. cetera. Um, and so one of those attacks uh, that we've seen is an attack on what we, we call cross-device uh, flow social engineering exploits, or we actually have a name for that now. We call it cross-device consent phishing. Um, 
And there's sort of a couple of flavors of this, but in general, the way this works is that there's an attacker that controls an initiating device. Um, they initiate a session, they obtain some kind of artifact, a code, a user code, or a QR code, and then they change the context on that. And they send it to an unsuspecting uh, user, um, and we've seen a number of variations of this, uh, putting it, you know, physically putting something up on a bus stop and hoping that somebody will come around and scan it, which does happen, uh, or in email more typically, uh, with some way, you know, it's either uh, fear or greed, right? Click to win or um, scan here and sign in or we will delete your SharePoint site. And people do that, they aptly scan, they authenticate, and they can use any number of authentication mechanisms. So MFA uh, kind of gets bypassed by these attacks. The user authenticates uh, to the authorization server, which then releases access and refresh tokens to the initiating device. And so at the core of this problem is really this unauthenticated channel between um, where the, the uh, session is initiated and where the authentication happens. And so, um, uh, so this is sort of the problem that we've been looking at um, uh, um, and, and trying to find solutions uh, for. Uh, so we sort of uh, launched a couple of different uh, approaches, not just uh, work here, but also outside of the IETF. Uh, I think uh, we've started looking at very pragmatic mitigations. What can we do now? Also exploring alternatives and making recommendations about using alternative protocols. And then also looking at sort of more foundational underpinnings. Can we use, um, uh, can we use formal methods? Uh, and is there some analysis that we can do? Is there some suggestions? Uh, even just to assess the effectiveness of some of the countermeasures that we're proposing. So, um, okay, so where are we on this? So we started uh, back, I think, at the open uh, or at the OAuth uh, security workshop in 2021, where we first identified the problem. Um, and since then, uh, we've gotten as far as having the working group uh, adopting the draft for a set of practical mitigations. And uh, we've just uh, updated that to second uh, uh, iteration of, of that document. So uh, there's the BCP. There's a QR code that you can scan if you dare. Uh, <laughs> I, I, felt, I, I felt conflicted about the QR code, but I thought I'd put it up in case somebody wanted to scan it uh, or felt brave. Um, so really what's new in this uh, latest version is I think last time around we had a discussion about what to name the, um, the attacks and uh, I think we came out with uh, calling this cross-device consent phishing. And so we've updated the draft to sort of um, consistently refer to uh, this attack uh, or type of attack as uh, cross-device consent phishing attacks. Um, the other uh, thing that we did was uh, in the previous draft, we identified sort of three different uh, types of cross-device flows that are being exploited by the attacks that we're seeing out there. Um, the terminology for describing it wasn't, I think we got feedback that that was not very helpful or not very clear. And so we took this to the mailing list as well. Uh, and so three new names, um, sort of focusing user transferred session data. So this is where the user has to scan or re-enter a code. The back, and, and that is typically what is used by the, um, by the de uh, device authorization prompt or uh, um, uh, device code flow. And then the back channel transfer session pattern, so similar to SIBA, the um, uh, 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 SIBA flows from OpenID. Uh, and then uh, the last one is this user transfer authorization pattern. So this is the typical flow of, I send you a code and you and go and enter it somewhere else, right? So it's sort of the user uh, entering the authorization data. So those are the three names that we, um, uh, that we changed and uh, also consistently updated throughout the document. So that's a new, um, so things to do next. Uh, so the first question, so this is something that I also took to the mailing list. I haven't seen any response yet. When we originally wrote the document, uh, we didn't put any normative requirements or any normative text in, right? So there's a lot of recommendations about what you should do. Um, and then as I went and I looked at other security BCPs, I noticed that, well, there are normative requirements. Um, 
And so my proposal, or so we prepared um, a PR. You can again, if you feel brave, scan the QR code to have a look. But really, um, the idea is if we add normative requirements, uh, it will give clearer guidance on what's uh, to implementers, what they should do with authorization servers, what they should do with clients. Um, also, the importance of specific um, uh, mitigations can be emphasized. And also, it makes some sort of uh, conformance or adoption meaningful, right? If somebody says, I am uh, adopting or using or uh, deploying mitigations as defined in this BCP, it should give some in indication at least of uh, what, you know, what people should or, or uh, uh, be able to expect. So the proposal is to adopt normative text. Um, uh, there's no musts at the moment in there, so it's all things that you should or uh, should do or is recommended to do or that you may do. Um, and I'd like to, actually, that's a question for this group here is to see if there's any concerns with adopting a normative text or, uh, or uh, any reasons to not do it, um, or if there's any support for doing it. <laughs> any thoughts? The, the use of the normative language makes a lot of sense, in my opinion. Uh, it's not just for, like in general, it's not it's not being said that in a PCP you can't use normative language. So, okay, thanks, yeah. Anders. Justin. Yeah, I agree that uh, the use of normative text does make sense here. It's as with any RFC document, it's optional to follow a particular RFC. So. You're saying that this is best normative uh, or best current practice, and if you are following that practice, then yes, these are the requirements for following that practice. The agreement to follow the best current practice is a separate decision, and if you don't agree to do that, then you're not bound by any of that in any any meaningful way. So I agree that um, uh, adding normative statements to this document where they make sense, where we want to be clear about uh, the decision space. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Justin. Roman. I think Joe's ahead of me. I can't, my, I'm not on the internet. I can't hear myself. Uh, hi, R Roman Janelio, uh, putting on the AD hat. Uh, I, I think the idea of, of normative kind of guidance is kind of good. The only thing I would kind of caution based on how I see us discuss things in the ISG when we talk about should, may, and recommended, Great to use that normative language, but make sure you talk about the trade-offs. Of So if it's should, there's a reason why you didn't say must. So kind of talk about what would be the corner case, why not to do that? And then, you know, with May, kind of the rest of it. So explain the back half of why it's weaker and not a must. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Joe. Joe, I was just going to say what Roman said, so. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay. Okay, uh, I think that sounds like some good, clear guidance. A um, couple of open issues. So we've got five of them. We, uh, I think two of those are related to specific uh, guidance. Um, uh, a couple of editorial things. A big, the, the other big outstanding issue is uh, updating the section that talks about formal analysis. I think right now it reads along the lines of, yeah, that's a good idea, you should do it. Um, and so we're uh, hoping to progress that at the OAuth security workshop at the end of August. Uh, so moving to maybe the next slide. Here we go. Uh, so we've been working with uh, researchers from the University of Stuttgart. Um, so they've uh, been working specifically on the device authorization grant and will be presenting some results at the OAuth security workshop in August. Following that, uh, we will update the draft to reflect any specific outcomes. I think there's a one or two small things at this point, but uh, that is uh, sort of an expectation that we'll have that, that that section gets updated after that. Awesome. And, um, and then I think the other uh, bit of interesting, uh, uh, something that I'm quite excited about, and I think Justin ha uh, suggested this back in, um, in London in IATF 115, is We've been also started a collaboration with uh, Royal Holloway University of London to do some research um, specifically around UX guidance for cross-device flows. Uh, so uh, Miriam uh, Mermezat uh, will be uh, will have an opportunity to present at OSW some of the 
initial literature work, uh, I think one of the interesting things is that there's currently no research available on cross-device flow uh, security UX. Uh, so there's some more work that will come there that we might benefit from in the future, probably separate from work that we document in this um, uh, BCP. But uh, again, I wanted to share that for folks who will be there. Uh, this will probably be in the on-conference section and uh, an opportunity to engage with uh, the researchers on this as well. Awesome. Um, and I think that is everything. So next steps, I think uh, we close on what to do about the normative requirements. So that's really good. Uh, update to the formal analysis section coming. A couple of open session uh, 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 issues. And then one thing that I want to check with the chairs, uh, the possibility of maybe issuing a working group last call prior to IATF 118. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the latest, at 118. So that yeah. would be a goal. Well, it, it depends a little bit on on the group to whether it's possible to finish the open issues that you just flash up on the screen. Uh, of course, right. And so if we can, uh, I think my ask is, if we can get those open issues closed uh, before 118, do we need to wait until 118 no. before we issue no, no. a last call? No. Okay. We should be able to start it before that for sure. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that I also want to signal that we want to signal as the editors is, you know, we, we sort of, uh, we do want to sort of move this document along so that it doesn't, uh, you know, stay in a draft state forever. Yeah, okay. okay. That sounds good. Okay, I think that's everything that I had. Um, any, any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I would talk briefly about uh, uh, a document I wrote. Um, the background is that there's currently a lot of uh, work going on and attestation in the IETF and different working groups. In fact, I've just uh, realized this week that Nat Smith and uh, Thomas Hacciano, who you know, um, are going to have a site meeting on using attestation in OpenID Connect uh, sometime during the week. We'll try to forward that to the, the list in case anyone is interested in. So I put this document together as a, as a contribution for a discussion on um, sort of using some of that technology also in OAS and at the same time Tobias also submitted the document. Uh, so, so this is, uh, I think, something we, we should be looking into as a technology for OAS and improving security. Next slide. So why is this suddenly? Um, attestation is a fairly old concept. Uh, if you remember the early work on, on um, in the trusted computing group on TPMs, and there was already work in the IETF standardization work with the trusted, uh, uh, there was a group working on how to use uh, the attestation for network access authentication uh, called NIA, um, long, long time ago. Got a little bit quiet over the time um, for whatever reason, but suddenly there was a renewed interest in this area, I believe mainly driven by the work on confidential computing uh, and also the availability of the hardware in um, mobile phones, in, in laptops. Um, nowadays, most of the tablets and laptops have um, some form of either TPM or some other uh, attestation hardware, and also on the server side as well. And that has triggered uh, work in a, or the formation of a new working group in the IDF, the IDF RATS, Remote Attestation Procedures Working Group, in case you have not seen that. Um, the bunch of good documents uh, being worked on, including terminology, uh, harmonizing t terminology across all these different attestation technologies, which was really needed. Um, as well as some uh, ways to, to do remote attestation in IETF protocols, uh, for example, network uh, management protocols uh, in that group. But there's also um, work on adding attestation to transport layer security, as well as later this week uh, for using uh, attestation in, in, in the PICX environment with CSRs, uh, certificate signing requests. So in case someone is interested, the LAMPS working group meeting will discuss this later this week. And there's also work on 
which I believe is related uh, specifically to the dynamic client registration on IoT device onboarding. So in a nutshell, um, there's some work going on and it looks promising. What will come out of it, uh, we'll see in a couple of years, I would say. The, the downside is um, lots of different organizations and companies have developed independently at the station technologies. And so one has to deal with all sorts of uh, different ways and has different properties, different formats, encoding formats, whether it's a CBOA based or X509 based or some other proprietary uh, formats. So you can look at uh, things from TPMs um, 1.2, 2.0, all the way to the TCG dice, uh, which is a more modern technique and a lot of things in between. And of course, the details uh, matter there. Next slide. So why, why do you want to use it in the first place in case you have um, never looked at any of this attestation? In, in principle, it's quite simple. Uh, it's kind of a document, a signed document with information about the device, uh, about who manufactured the device. It includes information about the software, typically also with measurements about, the, about that software, meaning a hash is computed over that software and also like low level software, like firmware and, and like other, other low level software, like uh, let's say bootloaders, for example, um, but also the layers above. So it can be quite flexibly applied. Um, there's also indication about the security properties of the device where it has certain, um, for example, uh, whether the, the debug board is locked uh, and, and something or whether a secure boot is used and so on. And all that information can be communicated and that information, this document is then signed by the low level uh, software slash hardware. It's typically a combination of software and hardware that uh, works here. And it signs that document and makes it available using remote attestation using some of the internet protocols we are working on. And if you want to look at the full story of um, how this looks like. There's a, the RATS working group published an RSC on this uh, with different glory details on, on all of this. And if you want to see what sort of a collection of items, information elements that get exposed with different attestation technologies, there's uh, a document called the EAT entity attestation token, which elaborates on these, uh, on these data elements. Okay, so there's, um, there's, there's a lot to, to look at. The RATS document also talks about different patterns on how remote attestation works. And one, there are two primary, primary patterns. One is called the passport model. The other one is the background check model. I only flashed up here the, the passport model because that's the one I described in the document. Uh, but the other one is also applicable in, in, in the scenarios of interest here in this group. And it's, it's quite simple. Um, there are three parties. The attester is the device that has this um, attestation technology in there, and it makes produces that document. Um, and any this information is at this point not really trusted in any sense. It's just a signed document. It's called the a RATS group calls it evidence, and that gets passed to the party that consumes it. But typically, the relying party will not be able to really make a good assessment about this because it needs all sorts of information. For example, in the previously mentioned um, hashes of firmware, for example, you obviously need to have the reference values. So you need to know what you expect the device to run as a low level software, which an ordinary relying party like a web server typically doesn't know. Um, it also has no information about, for example, the certificates of the, the vendors that produce those um, or the, of the certificate that corresponds to the signing key, for example. It also doesn't know anything about devices that have been, uh, for, uh, of keys of devices that have been removed. So that's why there's another role entity, uh, the verifier who has that information or is supposed to have that information and thereby the evidence gets uh, sent to that verifier kind of delegated, outsourced, and obviously needs to be trusted by the relying party 
to do this. And what comes back is sort of a, a standardized result called the attestation result. And that's what the relying party then uses to make a judgment together with policies that it has locally on whether that's good enough for executing that request. So that's kind of the, the, the model uh, in case of the, this password pattern. And that's also like the basic terminology. There's obviously more terminology, but I'm, I'm abstracting here a little bit for the, for the benefit of this meeting. Okay, next slide. And if we map this to, to the OAuth case, the Atesta um, is kind of inside the, the OAuth client. And the relying party is, is the AS in, in case of the dynamic client registration. There's also um, a nonce that comes into the picture because some of the attestation technologies, in order to demonstrate that this document that they expose is fresh, it has to use some mechanism. And many of the attestation technologies rely on nonces for that freshness guarantees. There are other freshness guarantees, but not all attestation technology unfortunately, unfortunately use the same freshness mechanism. Surprise. Uh, but uh, so I had to, in the write-up, I had to take account for that. For example, the DPM or DICE-based attestation uses nonces for freshness as an example. Okay. And so what does the document do? Um, it attempts to improve dynamic client registration by conveying this evidence in the registration also using defining how to get the nonce in the first place. But it's agnostic otherwise of the attestation technology it uses because we didn't want to settle for one and it most likely, or already today you can see that some attestation technologies are used in some environments and for example, in a mobile environment, you obviously have uh, technologies by, by, the, by the big brands, but in a desktop uh, laptop setup, you have a DPM based attestation and a server side with confidential computing, it's yet another technology. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, you, you, with attestation, if it, wants, if it claims to be secure, it's typically a combo of hardware and software that needs to work together there. And you see some of those um, technologies being mentioned like enclaves, trusted execution environments, secure elements, uh, you name it. All of them, like different technologies prefer different uh, implementations, so to speak. And the suggestion with the document is to look into this area uh, and see how OAS can benefit from, from sort of this ongoing industry trend. And then also collaborate with some of the other working groups in the IETF to see whether there's something that can be, we can come up with that is harmonized across different groups. And then next slide. And then maybe uh, like look at some of the details. I think there's a lot of value in that can be gained judging from the discussion I had with the buyers in, in looking at some of the running code. Um, like there's subtle nuances on, on the, the technology we are looking into here. So i and it has implications for, for use in OAuth. So getting our hands dirty, uh, as, as people in this group uh, always like to do anyway, um, would be beneficial here. And then there's more talk about attestation with, uh, with the work that Tobias has been doing. So I think, uh, I think there is something there to look at. OK. Aaron. Hi, Aaron Parecki. Um, I agree that there's, it seems to be a reaching a tipping point of a lot of interest in this topic. And I'm also very um, interested in solving this problem as well. Um, back in, back last year at the OAuth security workshop, I actually did a session about this as well, about using uh, attestation as either client authentication or in dynamic client registration. Um, and there was generally, interest in it, but um, nothing really immediate came out of it. Um, however, I did hear two examples of people who had already deployed stuff like that in the wild. And since then, I've also come to learn about other similar deployments that have um, been done 
using some large identity providers. Um, in thinking through this a little bit more, I'm, I, I'm starting to lean towards not overloading either dynamic client registration or client authentication with this new functionality, but instead making it another layer. So um, kind of paralleling what's already been done with uh, the resource server world of you can like you can use the Apple APIs and send uh, you know, generate one of these attestations and send it up to an API and people do this, however they do it in addition to other API access control. So they'll still send in an access token and then they also send this attestation. And I kind of think that might be a better way to parallel it for the rest of the OAuth world as well, where you might have a dynamic client registration that has only a client ID, no client secret, and then you also send attestation. Or you have a different scenario where you can have some sort of other authentication that you're using for your dynamic client registration, but you also still want to add attestation to it. Um, and same with other forms of client authentication. So it just seems to me like it's probably better to uh, pull this off as its own thing that we can then repurpose in a bunch of different places rather than trying to make it fit client registration or client authentication. Yeah. Uh Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, that was exactly the type of feedback I was looking for. Unfortunately, I missed the last year's uh, OR security workshop, so I missed also your talk. Thanks for pointing. In. I will, if there's a recording, I will uh, uh, look into that. Uh, there's no recording, but the slides are. Available. Okay, that's uh, good enough for me. Um, so yeah, uh, when I chatted with Tobias, um, uh, he thought it would be good to have uh, a chat, a conference call. Maybe we could expand that to uh, whoever is interested in that uh, topic. Because I think, obviously, there's, there are different design choices, uh, and we should look at the pros and cons of each of those. And um, yeah, I'm not surprised that some of the IDBs already make use of those technologies. It appears to be, make a lot of sense now, in retrospect. <laughs> awesome. Oi. Hi, uh, Ori Steele. Um, so I was hacking my way through a web auth end implementation and I was trying to make sense of what the connection point between web auth end and OAuth should be in this context. Mm -hmm. And I may have just missed the relevant document that completes this picture. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, with the, the skit work that we, you know, we've been doing for uh, securing software supply chain, you know, we have this desire to have the really, really strong authentication coupled into a relying party that is storing a lot of cryptographic material that's very relevant to the, the, the tester or the authenticated entity. Um, so if, if you could point me to the way to do, you know, access tokens with WebAuth and in the, like just that, that document that kind of completes that particular picture, uh, or, you know, maybe I'm using the wrong words to describe the request. Um, yeah, I, no. I think you do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but definitely using the wrong words. Yeah. Uh, no. just, I'm... You're using the right words, it just doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure he's using the right words either, Mike, okay. but you well, can go to the, uh, but maybe that's, uh, that's, that's the type of discussion we, sh we should be having. Specifically, like you have a very specific use case. I built uh -huh. a thing and I have no idea whether it's like legal or a good idea. So. Um, I'll come talk to you. Sorry. Yeah, Tobias, I, I just want to obviously throw support behind this. Um, there will be more conversation in the presentation I'll do on Friday on that um, related to this. And, and just wanted to also call out um, beyond kind of native apps usage of these platforms. I think you sort of talked about it, Hannes, but um, work workflow identity use cases as well. Uh, I know I've had a conversation with Peter about this and there's, there's, you know, it's not just constrained to certain client types and perhaps the, the current state of the presentation we'll give on Friday might give that perception, but I wanted to kind of clear that up that I think um, the usage of these kind of attestations generally in OAuth um, look to apply to a variety of different client mm -hmm. deployments um, and we should be trying to join that conversation up and, and do it in a holistic manner. Yeah, definitely. And so, so like you just heard, uh, Ori had more this web application focus. Uh, there's the 
obviously the app focus uh, that you also have your, in your uh, presentation. But then the workload uh, aspect is, is interesting and we had uh, various debate on, on this as well because there you exactly have this problem that you, you have the, the workload coming up, it's not configured, but it wants to use OAuth. It has attestation information, but no credentials at this point in time beyond that. And so how do you get to a working configured OAuth client at this point in time? And so uh, there, there are a couple of uh, sort of different areas we need to look into. Um, and maybe there's huge amount of differences to warrant different solutions, and, but maybe not. Uh, we don't know yet. Okay. Joe Salloway. Um, yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think kind of separating this out as its own thing is probably a, a good idea because you're going to want to be able to to support these different kinds of use cases. Yeah. Um, I kind of would like to see some things like improvements in client authentication, right? But that I think is a, a separate thing. But we may also have to pay some attention to how these things will link together at some point as well. Yeah. And the, the great thing is also that we have uh, experts here in the IDF who worked on some of the attestation technologies, uh, people who chair the groups who define those. So there's uh, an opportunity to get sort of like the, the first hand knowledge on, on those and see what the nuances are and what the state of affairs are in terms of deployment. Peter. Uh, yeah, so definitely very supportive of this work and uh, the conversation. And I think figuring out how it fits with some of the other proposals that's being made. Uh, I think I'm thinking specifically of uh, some of the biases uh, uh, proposals. Uh, in the context of workload identity. Uh, I'm also curious to get your thoughts on how it fits with attestation concepts uh, that may already exist in the workload identity space. Uh, so for example, Spiffy already has this idea of attestation. Uh, would you think about a Spiffy identity as an attested identity? Uh, how would that fit with this? I think that that's going to be an interesting set of conversations yeah. to work through. For sure. Yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I was very much inspired by the discussions we had on, on these workload identities, to be honest. Uh, specifically, since uh, Spiffy takes an interesting uh, approach on what the interoperability goal is. Uh, so they are the intro, as you, I don't tell you, but the, the rest of the group uh, um, that the interoperability is more defined, at least in that project, locally at the APIs between the workloads and the agents running on that, uh, that device. Uh, so it's kind of what we would consider in the ITF, like programming language API almost. Uh, but the interaction between the agent and the servers um, is, is kind of non-standardized. This is an implementation-specific detail. And that's where something like this could fit in instead of using some proprietary APIs uh, to configure the OAuth client, you could use some standardized mechanism. And um, how, how that technique in detail would look like, I think that's something the group needs to work out. But I, I see potential there to come up with a standardized mechanism. And I would kind of nicely align with what Spiffy does, sort of like providing an end-to-end -end standardized solution. Mike. Yeah, Mike Jones, um, this is a question for Joe. You kind of intrigued me with your line about you want to see improvements to client authentication. What, what are you thinking? So this is specifically the thing that I've run into is this thing called private key jot authentication, which mm -hmm. is one of the only ways to do client certificate authentication without using TLS. There aren't many other ways to do it. And that mechanism, suffer, you know, it's okay, but it suffers from some problems, like mainly this freshness problems. It doesn't have a knots, right? You know, the, uh, the, the client's just signing a, a self-signed jot in a sense. You can put a timestamp or something in that, but that could have been signed at any time and then replayed at a later time and the client no longer has access to the key, things like that. And so that that's the kind of thing I'd like to see. And then... I'm not sure how that relates to what Ori said as well. There's, you know, the client auth seems like it's it's not, re, it's kind of been on the outside of the specifications, at least the ones that have been worked on here. And I think that shows a little bit. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, 
because also the, the effort in LAMPS um, is specifically motivated by the ability to indicate whether that private key is in hardware, stored in hardware and cannot be exposed. Uh, so that may be an interesting thing to know. And also some of the attestation mechanism go beyond platform attestation. Uh, they do more than what I initially said about signing a document. They actually provide key attestation, so they are more powerful. So it could actually ramp up the, the level of security quite a bit. Done now. OK. But, Thanks, Hannes. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but maybe if, if like, for those who are interested, um, like if we have a call in August to talk a little bit about this, um, with Tobias, we we wanted to do that anyway. But if I see like Ori and and, and a couple of the other guys, so uh, uh, Joe uh, and obviously Peter, and just maybe uh, Rifat. Yeah. May it sounds like an yeah, interim yeah. meeting at this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And George also was interested. So yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Okay. I think we are done. Any anybody has any other business? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow, guys. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You dig deeper into the topic, right? Like yeah. instead of this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you, man. Sure. Good to see you. Looks a bit. You are good. You went out running with Echo, but yeah. So